Okay. Okay, amazing. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Uh, we have Michael from Gradient AI today. Uh, so we will talk about his open source project called Infinity. Um, I'm very excited to hear the use cases, like when I can actually use Infinity uh, in what kind of situations. And also the comment about Rust uh, versus versus Python. It's, it's something personal <laughs> that I'm <laughs> curious about. Uh, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, people, um, this session is meant to be super relaxed. If you're a new joiner, please feel free to jump in anytime for questions. Drop them into the chat if you don't want to be recorded. Um, so please feel free to uh, engage as much as you want. Um, so yeah, stage is yours, Michael. You can just introduce yourself, uh, a little bit mm -hmm. about what you're doing, what you did so far, and then we can jump into the topic. Cool. Uh, yeah, hi, welcome everyone. Uh, this is, first of all, this is a super interactive session, so please feel free to interrupt, um, start a discussion. I also brought a couple of slides, I brought a couple of, of demos uh, back and forth and make it a, a bit more interactive and feel free to to ask and we'll try it out and uh, hope everybody will um, will learn a bit of, of things. I'll, I work currently as as um, ML engineer here in, in Gradient um, where I work obviously on on kind of embeddings in France. I think it's kind of now open secret that in parts we use some of the components in Infinity directly in our production. So it's it's kind of meant to be a um, embedding service that is kind of ready for for kind of broad settings and running a, a public API. And then uh, beyond that, working on on model development where we open source new. Um, new models have also some closed source and will work actually not uh, too much as directly with with as a public API provider, but also work more with like enterprise and then working on proof of concepts uh, and so on um, directly with, with some people. So I'll I brought the the um, let me share the whole screen actually because there will be some demos back and forth and VS code and so on. Let's see how it goes. I hope you can see something here. Not yet. Okay, now no, we can see. No, no. Okay. Um, so here's our company template. We're in the 1950s and we hope that our infra or like infinity also won't port you back to this, the state of where you have to go press all these buttons here. And yeah, let's get right started. Um, I'm Michael, machine learning engineer, and I actually commit to a couple of random open source projects that are all based in like language models, inference, and so on. Um, what was the goal actually when when I started Infinity? It was kind of a I've seen kind of some inference engines popping up for like it would be like kind of a plugin replacement as you think of like the OpenAI API. People were saying like, okay, we can we somehow get that like um, running locally or run it on our server and run it as an endpoint? And there were kind of some apps popping up for like local chat UIs and um, local kind of search solutions. And everybody would just kind of plug in their whatever Olama server or VLM server or um, whatever OpenAI compatible server to make it run. Uh, and basically whatever, collect their, their Go app to um, whatever was out there in the internet. Um, but then for um, for embeddings, really nobody thought about building a kind of compatible server for running the inference for that. And in my opinion, that has led to kind of some really weird solutions where a lot of startups have really built really bad solutions for like inference of embeddings. So I thought if I able to, to publish something and, and make a server there um, for embeddings inference, Maybe the entry bar will be a little bit higher, and then people can actually um, focus on what is kind of innovating and and what's coming next. If we have like kind of a better infra and, and a solid base to start from, so hope that's gonna be like by open sourcing that being a push for for kind of open source for like um, for other companies to 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 build something on top of that and build something I'd say even more exciting than than just the inference engine as a service. Um, so kind of I'll I'll demo actually that thing here in, in just a second. Um, 
So it's meant to be super easy. And I'm also inspired by the VLM project. Um, and basically that's their, their, their um, pitch. You can like install it super easy. You can just run basically this command right now in your Python environment and your Python um, in any shell actually um, that you, you would like on, on most operating systems. Um, you just install it and then you have the command line argument of like running the model name and you want to run, I don't know, this embedding model here. And what you can do then is you can build your own client and say, okay, I want to post my uh, request here for this thing uh, and, and get the embedding for this kind of sentence um, from the server. But what's even more exciting is that this is a very standardized format. So you can maybe even if you, somebody else has built like an existing app well, that that you API, um, you can just plug that one in. Um, so let's demo that. Um, so when you when you go actually in like something like VS Code, prepare that thing over here. Um, then um, what we can do. Can you just this... a little bit, Michael? It's super uh, small for us right now. <laughs> right, got it. Okay. Um, I hope that's big enough. Yes, it's a little big. Okay. Otherwise, can reduce. So when we do that, um, we have kind of a terminal here, and we can just run the Infinity Embedding Server, um, checking that out, and you can get like kind of some with the help command, get some some info about that. Let me expand that that section actually. Make it look a bit nicer. So we kind of can select a a model that we want to deploy. Um, go in there, run, for example, the EAE VGE. So this is just a um, a model straight from, from Hugging Face. Um, and then um, this one is starting up. There's kind of some magic going on. Um, and then we get actually kind of some, some high inference so we could get like around like three and a half thousand um requests for like short sentences so actually kind of some query with just one token in this case and then roughly like 376 um sentences basically if you if you say so at max token length per second for this small model that's like a uh, bird small size and that what you can do is you have kind of this Swagger page, which is kind of convenient to open. You have this one here. You can try out all the things that are on there. So you can verify that you've deployed the right thing. You can click here, try it out. It's basically a get request to the slash models endpoint. And if you send that, you get the information back. And it looks very familiar from like a format. You have the BAE uh, model here. Um, you have like current time and so on. Um, so that might be very convenient if, if something some app is like relying on that and then you also can embed any sentence so i can say embed this sentence and post it there and then we get the embedding back um that's basically a bit about the what what can it do um so let's let's stick a bit deeper into that actually at this this point already and see um, what's like behind that and, and what's like, um, we start from this slide. Um, maybe from like a high level pitch perspective, there was kind of some some decision of like building that yet again as like kind of some, some closed source engine. Back then when I started out building this thing, um, a lot of similar solutions also didn't exist. So um, Quadrant had recently um, opened uh, Fast Embed as kind of a um, inference service for embeddings or inference package. And then also from Hugging Face, there's text embeddings inference, which also came out like later points. So these are kind of similar projects and I'll also do some, some kind of benchmarking. What is kind of 
interesting actually from building that thing as open source and building it also in Python. Uh, we, you, you just, we, we already said that um, I, I made like, was very like bearish on like the, um, um, on, on building or bullish that, on that thing in Python. And I'm, I'm particularly excited about like how slow Python is, but then how many integrations it has and how many, how much tooling there is to actually speed it up and then be in the end relatively fast compared to what you would expect Python to be. And I'll also go into kind of some, some depth on, on why it's that fast. Um, but one cool thing that you have besides that is you have a super cool um, unique ecosystem of where you can bundle all these kind of other engines and um, you have a lot of tooling basically available. So we can actually run the, the embeddings in France uh, in, in four different kind of engines. So we can run it in PyTorch and then also there's support for running this thing in, in TensorRT and ONNX that's kind of similar, it runs with the optimum package. And then also uh, a project I contributed to is C Translate to, so you can run this thing in, in basically in C++ um, and C Translate's inference engine. And these four like engines here, they really help you um, to where, where, for example, PyTorch is able to run on all of these ones, not fast on all of these ones, but um, you can actually access kind of a large ecosystem and run this thing on like, C currently supported is like uh, CPU and, and CUDA, obviously, um, as you might expect, but also what you might not expect is you can also run this thing on AMD, which is a bit of a beta thing. And then also on the AWS neuron chips, which, um, may come to to surprise that actually it's um, these two are like decently okay for running the, the inference for embeddings on it. And maybe also as a as a um, thing, we actually use that thing as I know that said um, to to power our own embeddings. Um, and what's also exciting, um, we have not too many um, contributors yet, but even more um, Docker pulls and so on from um, people using that Docker image end to end um, to run whatever kind of um, workload they would like to to have. So run some kind of search, run um, run an a embeddings endpoint as a public API, um, test out some things um, connected with their existing user interface, um, connected with Langchain and so on. So um, there's that, and. I'm actually considering if I should jump right to the next session of, of demos. Maybe it's um, um, with, with all the, 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 the devices, um, the goal would be like to build something that actually runs decently fast on, on all of them. Best would be if it would be fastest on all of them, but there is also some, some kind of Rust component, which is currently also quite fast, um, but it's hard to get there. Um, so when I did some, some rough benchmarking on, on throughput and maybe a, a short primer on throughput. The, what, what you're trying to build if you're building like an inference engine for embeddings, the latency is already quite low. So unless you're like in a kind of, you wanna get rid of like another millisecond, the, the thing you will be concerned about is um, how much am I paying per hour for this pod uh, where I'm running potentially this, embedding engine on. And then uh, as a second point, what do you be concerned about is like, is it like able to handle like this high load and most of the latency um, problems that you will see is probably because your, your um, server is completely drowning in like requests and you will not actually experience kind of the um, like two milliseconds kind of inference. Um, so you will have, it, it's not about like, what, what's the latency when I have like sending a single query, a short query potentially even to the server when it's completely idle because you practically don't want your server to be idle. So the question is like how, what's like an expected latency when the server is actually handling quite some load. So um, I generated kind of some benchmarks and these are like sending um, 10 requests or 100 requests depending on, on how you set it with 115K um, tokens each and these are like the basically throughputs um, on this axis of like how many 
of these 115k requests it can have this server can handle per second so if you have like a 0 0.5 here roughly then you would be able to handle roughly half of like 115k token requests per second and so you'd run up with, with something like 50k tokens per second from this um, on this hardware and if we look at that um, actually where where uh, the platforms where currently infinity runs quite fast is like on on the CPU on the CPU um, the solution that you need to build is quite simple you have not that of a complicated of an architecture um, a very fast engine for running that or backend is to actually run it in ONNX because uh, ONNX has kind of seen some some decent improvements from and support from like Intel and AMD to run and map the instructions for multiplying your your models fast enough and, and map that compile it to to basically CPU level and that's pretty possible there and then it runs here like an int 8 and, and fast and bad actually is, is pretty similar it also runs in ONNX um, then there's uh, sentence transformers which runs in, in plain PyTorch here on, on CPU and you see that like it's roughly only a third of the throughput that you can achieve on, on ONX and then there's Currently, Hugging Face TI, which is really optimized for like GPU workloads, um, specifically for only for NVIDIA. And that's where it's where like their candle frameworks really shines that you have everything end to end in Rust, but it's not really fast on, on the CPU, unfortunately. Um, and in fact, it's like only like um, one fifteenth of the, the speed of like ONNX. So it's basically not really usable um, if you have. Um, long requests, um, a lot of load on your server. Um, what's really interesting is like the, the primary platform for, for developing things currently is like on, on NVIDIA GPUs, right? So on the NVIDIA GPUs, actually Hugging Face TI is um, pretty fast. It basically does all the same optimizations in, in Infinity. And then you have an additional like 5% gap of where Infinity currently scratches the global interpreter lock. And you're basically maxing out the the um, performance on on Python and and hitting like 100% um, CPU load. And then at this point, your GPU is running idle for a couple of of milliseconds, and that's where you have kind of some gap um, where you actually can be faster. But what's the on the other side? What's the cool thing about it is that you actually can run. Um, and this might come as a surprise. So the L4 is kind of the uh, energy saving variant of of the Nvidia, uh, which runs like at seventy watts, um, and then there's for example the Mi two tens from from AMD, which I can also show later, which are kind of like half of an A one hundred class, um, if that is a name for you. And actually, you can also run the, um, the inference here on, on AMD, and then there's the Inf two X large um, instance, which looks kind of slow um, on this benchmark. Um, FYI, this the CPU is actually scaled. It should be like around eight times lower here, where you would not see anything. Um, it's running a, a bird small model. The rest is running actually bird large. And on Inferentia, the throughput is a bit lower, but this is also the lowest smallest instance for for Inferentia. And beyond that, also um, this can be like dirty cheap. Like if you can. You can potentially rent out these things for as a spot instance they're more available and you can rent them out like for like 15 cents an hour or something like that um in, in some times and that's a fairly decent throughput per per dollar basically if you if you say so for like a something that's available in in the public cloud currently um so so when looking at that um i was really surprised about some posts some posts are very um excited about um that they run their inference in Rust. Well, actually, the tooling in Python is currently much better when it comes to running it across multiple devices. And also, I think like most of the inference providers still are somehow stuck, I would say, in Python and have their main experimentation in Python. Uh, if a new model comes out with custom code, the only language you can run it from is like in Python, and you have to all other frameworks. So I run this like as a kind of part-time project, right? Um, it, it's really hard to 
if, if some kind of new architecture is coming out and somebody um, put kind of some small tweak to, for example, making like yarn attention in there so that you have longer context in there. This would be like requiring some integration in Candle while in Infinity, you can just run it with like the trust remote code setting and you'll pull in that. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of surprised. There was some some posts about here, um, this company who said they 4X the throughput by migrating from Python to Rust. Um, and unless they did like in full quantization, I, I don't see how actually they, they did that. Um, I'm, I'm still waiting on their response, but they must have had something like sentence transformers before and then switched to something like text embeddings inference, which actually, from a practical perspective, pulls already all the, the options that you can pull from when you're in Rust, while actually Infinity doesn't pull all the options that you can pull when you're from Python. Um, if you get um, feedback from them, just just let us know. I'm I'll, I'll let them know. I should have invited them uh, specifically for this talk. Um, oh. I think they they probably built something something pretty cool um, as well, and I, I trust that their the engineers are also pretty good mm -hmm. in some things. So I'm I'm really waiting and, and asking them how is that comparing to other Rust uh, Rust benchmarks. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Just let us know. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. There's that. Um. But. Maybe something something for you. I'll I'll not do this um um this talk actually as a kind of sell pitch for for my company. It's more about like how can we build like open source together and how can you start to to enter this field potentially or how can you make like if you're already in this field and and you would like to uh, you're currently working on something. Um, I would say let's make it happen and build some some open source. Um, and um, maybe this thing helps you to. To contribute to to the repo and contribute to the uh, maybe also potentially another repo, um, which ultimately will will help also like Infinity, um, looking at at other innovations and and pulling them in. So, some some kind of um, primitives of of how actually the sentence transformers works under the hood, or like how um, language models general work and then here specifically for, for embeddings inference. So if you have the sentence transformers package, you will see kind of this paradigm. Um, you, you will have some kind of, on the on the outer side, you'll have uh, potentially the, the um, you, you are um, posting your endpoint. Um, you get this request from, from the user, from this client and sending like, hey, embed this sentence or embed this list of sentences. And the most simple solution that is kind of often used is, okay, we load this model on the service data. And then when the single request comes for each request, we'll tokenize it. And then the tokenized um, has some kind of, um, after tokenization, we get the kind of the tensors out of the tokenization, um, potentially like PyTorch tensors. And then whatever kind of batch size we have from that, We'll put it through the model dot forward, um, and then have like the final layer there, and then we have some kind of additional pooling and so on after that, uh, and post process that. And in essence, maybe we limit the the batch size here to a certain maximum, but that's that's about it. And then what typically when people are are getting unhappy about that, there's kind of some drawbacks to that, and one of, I'll I'll get into all of them later. But the first drawback is like you have the tokenization and tokenization. Um, if you do tokenization at the same time, then the, um, the, your like model forward does nothing and the post processing does nothing, and um, you will be just tokenizing this text. And then people are like, okay, actually the CPU, the GPU was completely idle during that phase that is happening just on the CPU. Um, how can we make the the model forward more busy? And the intuitive solution that people have that have like a CPU book programming background is like, okay, yeah, we'll do that thing with more processes and we'll spawn a second of these second one of these models and a third one of these models. And then we'll just have instead of one times the RAM usage, we'll have it three times. And 
yeah um so we are like is that like the way we want to go to and it's like in python probably not so if you guys are aware of how multiprocessing works in python um spawning this kind of uh, process will take a lot of time uh interprocess communication takes also a fair amount of time in python so it's not a good good idea to do that and then also the there's kind of some interference of like this model forward pass and this one on the GPU. So actually, this is actually not the thing you want to go to to have multiple processes, um, kind of punching the, the pushing the or um, the GPU, um, to to kind of accelerate. So the thing, as as the first thing, um, I was starting out was basically just saying okay. How about like each of them runs in a separate thread? So thread not process. Um, and we tokenize actually just also leverages the, the Rust um, um, packages that are out there. So um, tokenization is actually written in Rust. So it, it doesn't block the guild. So you can just um, basically invoke it from Python and then don't have to worry about being potentially capped by like 100%. Uh, per core um, CPU usage or per uh, program. And then the model forward, as long as this one is not, um, uh, as long there's like um, these, these um, kind of small things here, these tokenized forward and, and process are each run as a separate thread and then they communicate over queues. So basically some, something is tokenized and then there's a queue where it says, okay, this one, this is like the max, this is kind of the, the batch I wanna, um, now as next put through the forward and this one goes into a queue and then we have kind of um, no longer the process that if something is tokenizing on the CPU, something also on the model forward can run on the GPU and so on. And that kind of helps you to keep this thing at like 100%, um, no matter how you, any optimizations that you have in there might come as an extra. And this is like the first thing and then the second issue that you're having is if you're running it as a public API, this will be like kind of the second, third optimization actually. Um, let me jump into what you can do inside the, the model forward pass at first. So model forward, something that people always see is like you can run the first, the, the model in like float 16 or B float 16. And then also kind of there's some, some flash attention on top of that. So that means the way it, you're potentially also using that if you don't pay attention, for example, in Rust, and you just say, okay, I have these, this tensor and this tensor, and they're potentially too big to fit them both in like the, say in the in the cache that is close to the to the tensor cores on the on the GPU, you might face some some issues of like when multiplying these um, uh, two gigantic like tensors, that actually you need to reload and offload a lot of things back into the main memory. And that will take you some time. So it's better to kind of do kind of some, some blocks of like uh, running through this like tensor block by block and kind of reusing as much as you can uh, or like avoiding as much as you can writing back to the memory. So that's kind of some, some innovation that came out like one, two years ago um, has been like steadily integrated in all kinds of frameworks. And then now with like Torch, um, two and greater, you are like able to do that. And then the third thing is what further helps you not writing back to the memory, but keeping um, basically your operation as single program as possible is to also use like torch compile and then kind of use some kind of operations. I can also potentially show it in a demo later. And the third speed up you might want to do is just kind of a very old concept that is still not employed if you just use the single um, sentence transformer is like dynamic batching. And that looks like the following, we have like some async embedding engine. So in Python, async means you can await for, for something. And that means you get like kind of some future back uh, which you are waiting for. And then once this one returns, um, you don't block basically. It's like, yeah, basically like running um, you could also do this with like threads, but um, doing that with multiple thousand threads a second, that might be a challenge in Python. So again, here you have to run it with like um, an async paradigm where you just wait for the embeddings. And what you want to have though is 
not to run this one and then at size one, the inference, you want to be able to um, vectorize kind of the, the computation of the forward pass of these two strings, for example. These are two users requesting potentially their string to be embedded. And then what you want to do is you want to batch them together. It's actually what, what is happening under the hood here. And then each of these, basically this batch runs through all of these um, it's kind of a data class of, for example, these two items here, run through it, and then each of the users gets basically their future back, which returns the embedding of their string. So this is kind of the, the third thing that you want to do. And it's pretty exciting to do that all in just plain Python, because it makes it very simple to, to integrate. You can actually just download the, the package, and all of this will run in just Python 3.10, uh, and then you just need NumPy on top of that. And that's basically the core. And then if you install also Torch, then you can already run dynamic batching, um, all of this, what I've explained. And it's not too big of a, of a package, and you can actually run it just uh, yeah from Python directly and build your own server around it, as you, as you will. Um, let's see. I could run some demo for for now, um, I could further like make short, um, kind of a short um, um, some kind of intro why it's like helpful to run that from Python. Um, if you do that from Python, you can like easily just run like infinity okay. embed, um, and then it comes as an exe on on um, on Windows, which is came to my surprise when I when I tried it out at first. And this CLI is then um, just run, and you can basically have the same thing as on, on Linux. Can you again, I can zoom in to the term. <laughs> yep. Okay. That works. So what you see is like on Windows, the support for Torch and, and everything is kind of not the thing I would recommend. So for example, what you can see, there's some kind of error messages coming up, for example, oh, um, hey, you're um, basically what this is saying, hey, um, Torch is not running on, on um, with flash attention on Windows, and that's actually correct. There is no kind of fused kernel yet available in like Torch 2.0, and kind of sad, but it still works. Um, you get a bit of a lower score um, in, in terms of like embeddings per second, but um, yeah, that's the case. And if you look at, for example, the Linux version, what's kind of exciting about it, you can turn on the the debug logs. Um, so how that would look like, let's also zoom in here. Uh, you can just put the torch compile debug, and that will use OpenAI's Triton compiler to basically trace kind of your the request you're having, or also just symbolically kind of compiling your model. So when we do turn it on. I'm sure not everybody has seen that kind of kind of feature. You'll see a ton of like OpenAI Triton code being generated, and that actually helps you. Um, so there's a, a ton of of Triton code and how Triton looks like. Let's wait until it actually finishes. Uh, they will have some some basically some additional start time that you have when you enable Torch compile, but in the end, hopefully, you'll be a little bit faster. So you have some kind of um, vetting here, um, which is hopefully faster than um, yeah, your throughput is faster than if you would not use Triton. But what you can actually see if we look down here, if they, we have some Triton code, for example, um, this one over here, you have some um, some Triton code that you can actually access on that's here saved under temp torch inductor and so on this pi file. And this is basically the content of it. I'm not going to open it right now. But what it says basically, okay, we have potentially a, a linear function with some additions going on and then a ton um, H activation. And what this here does is it compiles the thing and then run this thing as a single program. So you have like an addition of like these two inputs. Um, and it's kind of a mix between like the CUDA language and then also kind of the feels a bit like PyTorch to some degree. Where you just add and, and then put a ton H on that. And that's actually quite a cool ecosystem because you're able to kind of experiment with your model at the same time as, as also getting like a high 
um, kind of high high throughput immediately from Python. And also launching this thing, you launch this single, um, so that's what we call a kind of kernel in the CUDA programming language. And what we can do with, um, what we'll see if, if we fuse kind of more operations into that, like Python gets less and less important. It's just basically the instruction language, which is like in the beginning say, okay, hey, I wanna run these kind of instructions. And then the CUDA can basically run all of these um, at once. And it's not really important how fast the, the kind of language is that you're invoking this from. It's more about how advanced are your instructions that you're sending to your graphics card um, in this Go. And, and the, basically the compiler of the language that you're sending it from is not that important. It's more about um, the instruction that you're sending. Um, and then last, uh, or not actually last, we also have like the option to to run that on on AMD. So if we go on AMD, we see here there's like an MI210. Um, and then if I run it on MI210, um, it actually comes with a um, with a decently fast. Um, um, inference and, and actually kind of mature at least floating point 16 support. So people might be not aware that just running your um, your program might work, um, but there's actually some some kind of um, um, some kind of smaller um, incompatibilities in kind of these kernels. So what you see is, some of these like torch compile and also some of the fused kernels are specifically built for the uh, for CUDA. So you might not be able to get all out of it, um, but you should be able to just run standard PyTorch programs. If you're just not using any, any crazy stuff, like just FP16, you should be able to decently run it. And while doing that, um, um, yeah, this version also didn't ship with, with flash attention or memory efficient attention. But after all, you're able to run it and actually the, the speed in the end is quite of high, but this is also kind of a, a better GPU, I would say, um, than for example, my local one. So it's expected kind of to have some kind of higher, higher throughput on this machine. And I previously ran, I think the server, that's why it shut down, but overall you can see uh, it's still possible to run it. And then also, um, this is basically just a screenshot of like running it on AWS Inferentia. So on Inferentia, you see that also just running bird small yields you a kind of decent throughput. Um, not gonna show it, yeah. This is basically, um, Second part of the demo, so you see, you can using just Torch, you can run it on on some kind of um, different hardware. And a second takeaway that you should um, should take away, you can by by using kind of Torch compile and so on. You might run from like a slower language, but in the end, your your whole program, as you will, is still fast because you are able to run faster instructions on the GPU. So basically, as a kind of summing this up, you can easily get started. Um, there's some issues in like Infinity or also other repos um, with like help wanted starter or so on. And you're very encouraged to like, people are very friendly actually. Um, when you like reach out there, uh, comment there, like being proactive and say, hey, I'm interested in, in helping here. Um, this is not only going for like infinity, but also going for many other machine learning repos. It's like, hey, I just learned about this. I would like to contribute something. People are very open and will kind of help you and guide you how to get started with their repo because they are ultimately very interested in like um, you actively collaborating with them. And in fact, um, one thing that's really exciting is like, for example, about the CPU inference. I was not aware of like, for example, the ONNX optimizations. So people really just um, also open their issues, open discussions, say, hey, 
have you tried running that? Like, it seems to be slower than it should be. Can you try that on out? And so they're pointing you also to the right um, thing. So it can be really helpful to open also discussion. And there's also ways to, to basically collaborate outside of the repo. There's a lot of like discussions going on, social media, blogs, Llama index integrations, um, third party, other integrations. So uh, there's a lot of things that you can actually do and, and be active in. And then uh, last thing you can do is also open source for, for the encoders. There's not a lot of um, custom code. A lot of people focus on, on making architectures like Llama 70B faster and, and open sourcing how they quantize it, for example, or quantization or uh, GPTQ, but it's a bit of a challenge if you want to have like these smaller encoder models, um, typically from like bird architecture. Um, there's a little bit less of like infra support um, currently, and definitely there's some kind of optimization gap in, in terms of running these, these models with, with the special um, kernels. Yeah, that's basically all. Um, if you have questions, as I said at the beginning, you're very open to, to ask any of those questions. Um, I would be very happy to chat or just discuss. Feel free, I guess, to, to send it in the chat or um, also, yeah, just, um, just unmute yourself, basically, and, and ask anything you want. Yes, let's let's do a question round. Um, anyone having any questions, any remarks, anything? But anyways, like Michael is also on the, in the Discord server. He's also super chatty. You can just ping him on LinkedIn as well later on when you tr give it a try. Um, yeah. Mm, for the Rust and Python uh, conversation, um, yeah. we were doing the, the maybe I, I sent it already in the this Discord server. Mm -hmm. benchmarking experiments with it, it's not mm -hmm. an embedding inference but like multi-gpu inference um mm -hmm. and in the latency there was quite some overhead um in comparison to for example tensor rtllm when we use mm -hmm. LLM. so i was like that's <laughs> that's quite a lot uh and they also mentioned that in their repo so that was i was thinking okay should i even learn something else like rust is hype maybe python mm -hmm not going to be there in the future for inference. Um, mm -hmm. so that's why I was like, I'm curious now. <laughs> so basically, TensorRT LLM is a very good example of, uh, no, TensorRT without LLM, just TensorRT as it classically was from like a 2021, 2022 release. Mm -hmm. um, it's optimized for running in a very fast language to run it all from like C++. But then it turned out that, for example, specific instructions of like sending, um, for example, flash attention was very hard um, for the TensorRT compiler to figure out how to, to run this better like instruction set. So overall, the basically TensorRT, um, it's, it's basically having a lower throughput than the PyTorch version at this point. Um, just because basically flash attention is kind of missing as an integration. And mm -hmm. then running it from Rust, I think is, is an interesting perspective, but it also requires you to write a fair amount of like CUDA code directly. And I've not had too much of an, of an experience of, of launching your CUDA kernels from Rust directly. Um, I have to, have to admit here. So, um, I imagine though that it's it's kind of complicated to whenever a new model comes out um, to kind of get uh, make it compatible and make get if like well, one thing was also with Infinity to get like kind of correct results and get them potentially the day after the model was released um, having like correct results in your embedding engine and being able to just upgrade to this yeah. new model and. Um, that's very complicated. I think for um, at, at this point with the Rust advantage, um, I think it's not really worth it to to upgrade it unless you have basically this this kind of um, ten percent performance gap is able to to um, pay the the salary of like an engineer for like a whole year to maintain kind of this project. So perhaps if you're running the the OpenAI embedding service and have a very high 
server cost, at some point you might be able to to um, kind of um, yeah, it, it should be more than just a this small gap that we're seeing in in the kind of embeddings inference. But Rust can be definitely helpful in, in some ways. So um, there's actually a lot of of ways where I would love to have um, Rust, for example, in the communicating between these things. These are threads in Rust. Actually, they're just running them on multiple cores, uh, running tokenization with multiple workers and so on, and it will help actually doing that and also like sorting kind of these queues and popping from some of them. Most of these operations take unfortunately too much time in Python, even if they're like from an algorithm perspective, very interesting. The practical gain that you have when, when something's locked up is actually a bit lower. So there are some concepts that you can't, from an algorithmic perspective that you cannot um, implement with a speed up in, in Python currently. Yeah, yeah. It's it's always the the, the trade off like Rust is still not there anyways for the, uh, in sense of adoption so mm -hmm. too much of a work anyways. Um, okay, then I'll jump in with maybe some more questions, mm -hmm. if I may. Uh, yeah, first of sure. all, yeah, thanks for the interesting talk. It's definitely going to be super useful also mm -hmm. for me and for my work because I'm I'm just starting out with uh, writing some high performance inference stuff mm -hmm. so <laughs> this is mm -hmm. a godsend today <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah i have actually uh quite a few questions and some of them mm -hmm. you kind of partially addressed uh, right now so one of them was um for these cues on the exact slide that we are on right now mm -hmm. um so if i understood correctly this is all then written in rust um no uh, actually all of it is written in, in python and mm -hmm. The expectation would be there's some similar service, for example, um, TI from Hugging Face, which unfortunately doesn't run under a open source kind of license, but on a semi-commercial license. That's mm -hmm. written in complete Rust, but the expectation would be that kind of the the gap would be a bit bigger between like Python services and Rust. Um, mm -hmm. So just using the normal Python queues. Yeah. Uh, for, for this queuing here. Okay. For this um, one, yeah, mm -hmm. it's basically um, async you and like await kind of things and then Python queues mm -hmm. uh, from the queue library. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then maybe for the, um, oh yeah, for the dynamic batching. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you determine how many requests to batch in like one batch? Um, because I, I can imagine that mm -hmm. the batching itself is done so that you do not send batches of one, um, mm -hmm. a, or like it's better than sending batches of one, but obviously there is some kind of upper limit. You can just wait for a whole day and then batch all of these requests and send them, uh, send yeah. them in, right? So, so that's a good, a good question. Um, basically there's kind of a flag on the, the forward pass and mm -hmm. how it works is that usually the there's something here, the tokenization, and the tokenization in Python, it's not like you can tokenize them and then build a vector out of them later. Actually, that's how TEI in Rust does it, and it iterates over like lists of integers and then builds tensors out of them, and it's a very costly thing to do in Python. So in Python, you're unfortunately stuck with like, tokenize it, and you have this whole tensor, and then at this point, you're like, no longer, if you start slicing it or something, it's hard to Mm -hmm. You can't be adjust kind of the batch size. You need to know the batch size when you enter kind of this this whole pipeline here. And what happens is that if you get a request and your model is is gonna send say okay I'm currently it's either running some kind of inference or it doesn't run it. So at some point if the queue here is empty and it says hey I want from this queue from kind of from the tokenizer I need something from you. Mm -hmm. then um, it will put up a flag. And this flag, as it's like just read it, it will be read by basically before that, before the tokenizer. And it will say, okay, whatever you have right now, start tokenizing it because the, the model is really running out of um, things to come up next. So this queue is empty. Uh, we need to have something tokenized right now. And that's fortunately tokenizing is, is faster than the forward pass. Mm -hmm. So it will be like, whenever the model says, hey, I just processed the last thing from the queue, 
um, tokenize it, please. Uh, if you have something, put it into the, the queue right now, um, then you'll get something and this queue gets loaded and then the rest will be after the forward pass. You don't need to care to, that much anymore because the post processing is usually very light. And, mm -hmm. um, and so that's basically what's happening. Uh, you signal the, the queue and say, hey, give me something. I'm, I'm running out of it. I see, I see. Very interesting, thanks. Um, and then I, I think I had another question, but to be honest, I kind of forgot what it was. <laughs> so I might just, uh, when I remember it, I might just ping you on the Discord, yeah. if that's all right. <laughs> uh, maybe when I see the slides again, uh, it, will, it will come yeah. back to me. <laughs> but I yeah, thanks. To chat on, on, on Discord as well. Yeah, yeah. thanks for, for the question. Um, yeah, there's been also some some pretty ugly like implementation detail in the beginning of just um, if you if you start like tokenizing if you set this flag then it would start tokenizing and sending the forward pass at once and then the launch for the tokenize would kind of stop and slow down the forward pass so it has been like I don't know wait one one millisecond basically with the tokenization because usually tokenization is is very fast until the basically forward pass is, is essentially launched. Uh, its first kernel, and that's basically some heuristics. So um, I also look forward for like programming language or some kind of options to to avoid these kind of heuristics that ultimately help you kind of get like one percent more throughput. Um, yeah. So I'm guessing like it should be designed in a way that it's almost kind of like a stream, but maybe like a stream with a bit more buffers in it. Mm -hmm. Uh, because the tokenization, as you said, is usually faster, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I, I guess this is what we're looking for, but I mean, that's more of a conceptual thing than, <laughs> yeah. and I imagine implementation isn't that straightforward, but yeah, maybe that's some yeah. of the idea. Yeah, it's like hard to 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 deviate too much from the main paradigms in like tokenization forward pass, because ultimately you will also be um, if you deviate too much, you have to kind of build too much code yourself. And then the community outside in, in Transformers and so on is iterating faster. And then it's hard to keep up with the correct implementation for each of the new models that's coming out. Um, so you kind of just want to reuse some things that are out there as kind of an open source maintainer. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, any other question from anyone else? Feel free to post it also in the chat if you are not comfortable with being recorded. If not, okay. If not, I will say thank you, Michael. Mm -hmm. um, you can maybe share us uh, the slides in, in this yeah. form. You can send mm -hmm. it and I will share it, whatever mm -hmm. you prefer. Um, Jakob, feel free to go over it and find your question. Remember it, <laughs> and we can we can chat about it uh, on this mm -hmm. call. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Michael, and yep. um, uh, hope to see you at GTC. I guess. <laughs> yeah, looking forward. Amazing, amazing. Good evening yep. or good morning. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Yeah, have a good good rest of the day wherever you are currently. Yeah. You too. Bye bye. Bye.